Okay, so obviously I've got the, the Zoom going and I'm recording. I will try to not let the... So I also need to do that. I, I shall try to not let the technology get in the way too much of, of the lecture, but um, we'll see. And the other thing I don't know at the end is, so I'm, I'm recording with Zoom. There's some anonymity features in Zoom that make sure that people who, when you're recording, not everybody um, has their video shown. I've spotlighted myself on this computer. Hopefully it'll come out on the video, but I can't actually guarantee that. And can't really think of any way of testing it apart from giving the lecture and then looking at the end. So we shall see what happens, but if, if nothing, if things don't really work this time, then I'll try to get it to work better in the future. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so, this is lecture two of the course, and last week we did uh, the axioms. Axioms for sets. And this week we're going to do um, something that's going to be particular to this week, it's not really going to contribute to the main part of the development of the course, but it's an important thing to go through if we're looking at set theory, um, which is how the axioms we've got for sets allow us to essentially do mathematics using sets. And this is the sense in which set theory is, is a foundation for mathematics. So today we're going to show that these axioms for sets, well, we're not going to show it because to show it would be to do the whole of mathematics using these axioms, but I want to give you some ideas why these axioms for sets, then it's just a few axioms, they are sufficient to axiomatize mathematics as a whole. This is the way in which we get set theory as a foundation for mathematics. So, so this week, um, set theory as a foundation for mathematics. The point is that we just have these few, very few, there were just a handful of axioms from last week. And if we formulate mathematical concepts in a certain way, we can view them as stating properties about sets, even if they don't, it, in the first instance, look as though they're stating properties about sets. They're probably stating properties about numbers or algebraic structures or something like that. We can do them as stating properties about sets, and we can prove these properties just from the few axioms that we already have, um, plus potentially one or two more axioms. But I already mentioned last week the axiom of infinity, and which we won't do this week. Um, sorry, we will do the axiom of infinity this week, but the other axiom I haven't looked at yet, which is often used as the axiom of choice, um, and that will appear. That will play a larger role later in the course. Now, probably most of you who did Logica in Mathematica or Mathematica in Logica or whatever it's called in the, in the first year at, um, at some of uh, a few years ago um, will have seen some of this how you do mathematics in set theory already. It's only going to be one lecture today. I'm going to put a particular perspective on it. 
um, similar to, to last week. And this perspective is going to be looking at structures that we have in mathematics and characterizing those structures in such a way that are independent of exactly how we specifically define the structure in set theory. And then we'll have a theorem in each case saying that such and such a structure actually can be proved to exist from the axioms of set theory and therefore we could do the mathematics of such structures in set theory if we want by making the construction, but we don't need to ever use the construction, we can use the abstract characterization. And um, I want to focus on just two very specific aspects of mathematics, but perhaps the most important aspects of mathematics historically. So the mathematics that um, under underpins discrete mathematics. So today we look at we look in particular at so the discrete mathematics are particularly embodied in the mathematics of the natural numbers, the so number theory, if you like. numbers and then the main structures we need for them for continuous mathematics and of course the most important structure there is the real numbers some people might say the complex numbers are more important but if um if one define can define the real numbers one can define the complex numbers from the real numbers and of course vice versa as well so let's look at the natural numbers and the real numbers. Okay, so let's go to the natural numbers. And um, so as I said, I don't want the technology to get too much in the way of the lecture, but because it's my first time using it, I'm going to just uh, spend a little bit of time familiarizing myself. So um, even even to move board, I need to do something. Whoops, that's moving the wrong way. I need to move the camera. As I get used to it, I guess this will become more seamless. Whoops. Right. Okay, so first thing I want to do is show you that using our axioms for set theory, in what sense we can do the mathematics of the natural numbers. This may sound like a simple thing, but actually it turns out to be rather complicated in, in some ways. So I don't know to what extent you did it in Logica and Mathematica. Today I will go through all the definitions, but not through all the proofs, because if one did all the proofs, it would actually take more time than a three hour lecture could, in, could incorporate. And um, I also want to talk about the real numbers today. So I'll go through all the definitions. The main one is firstly to say, we want to work in our universe of mathematical entities that we've used to, we've, we've got this universe of mathematical entities that contains within it sets. It may contain numbers as, in, as, as independent things not defined in terms of sets, or it may not. In any case, irrespective of what's in the universe, what we would like to do is understand the structure of the natural numbers somehow independently of any one realization of it. So we don't we don't need to say. This exact this construction is the number zero, this construction is the number one. Rather, the natural numbers are a collection, countable collection of, of things with a zero, a one, and yeah, the natural numbers have the property that you basically obtain them by having a zero and having a successor operator that acts on the zero. And the natural numbers are everything you can get by 
iteratively applying the successor operation to the zero. So using the language we already have, then we could right, formulate quite a natural definition. So, so what I'm going to call the natural number structure, this is my own terminology, but similar things occur in many places. It's a natural number, number structure is the triple of things. So it's going to be a collection of natural numbers together with a zero, a distinguished element called zero, and a successor operation that acts on the natural numbers, where the collection, but ultimately we're going to want a set of natural numbers. But last week, we were starting off with the idea we have a mathematical universe and collections of things are prima facie, that's in the first instance, classes. But then we had some axioms that give us rules for saying when certain nice, well-behaved classes count as sets. A collection of natural numbers is certainly going to be a collection of things, so it's certainly going to be a class. Let's for the moment just leave it as a class. We're not going to require it to be a set yet. But we will come to requiring that later. It's interesting to see how far we can go by not requiring the natural numbers to form a set. So n is going to be a class. Zero is simply some distinguished, some chosen element of this class. And s is a class function. So S is a function from the class to itself, but give it a natural number and it will give you the successor natural number. And on top of this, we want to say that this zero and zero element and successor function generate the class of natural numbers and so that this is we want this to be the somehow the smallest collection of things that contains zero and is closed under the successor moreover we also want properties like if we take zero and we apply the successor to it arbitrarily many times we never go around in the cycle and get back to some if we keep on adding one we always get a new different natural number from one we had before. So at the moment, this is just a class together with any element and some function on it, and that could be arbitrarily badly behaved. So we need some additional properties. The additional properties are basically the ones I've said. So firstly, the successor function, we want it to be injective. We've got two different natural numbers, and the, and the successors of those two natural numbers are also different. So uh, S is an injective function. So for this would be such that s dot t dot. So s is an injective function or one to one. And so for all n in the class, and for all n and m in the class. They have the same successor, and they are equal. So, rather than being injective, we're going to require S to be, I'm going to call it acyclic, I might call it characteristic zero. Um, I'm going to say we can't, if we iterate S a finite number of times, we never get. We never get back to zero. Um, well, actually, if we ever apply S to anything, we never get back to zero. So S is called a cyclic. Um, by that I mean so for all elements of our natural number structure, if we apply S to M, then we don't get zero. So successors are never zero. And thirdly, the, the most important property of all 
is the one that's saying that's going to say, moreover, the natural numbers don't have anything in them apart from zero and elements that we get by generating zero. And we can formulate that by giving it as an inductive property, an induction property that this structure satisfies. So, so lastly, induction, the induction principle, which is, so what we want to say essentially is that the natural numbers are the smallest class that contains zero and a closed under successor. So since we've got this class M that contains zero and closed under successor, well, we, we can ask that any subclass of M that contains zero and closed, well, if we have a subclass of M that is contained zero and closed under successor, then it is the whole of M. Or in fact, if we have any class that contains this zero and is closed under successor, then N is contained in that class. So that's the way I'm going to formulate it. All these proper principles are equivalent. But so I'm going to say um, for any class X, if zero belongs to X and X is closed under successor, so and for all. Now we can only apply successors to class function from n to n, so we can only apply successor to, to an element of this supposed natural elements, natural number class. So to apply successor to an element of x at all, it needs to also belong to n. So we so we'll ask for, for any x that belongs to n if x belongs to x. Then, um, that's the, yeah. I'll just put it as an implication. Same thing. But I don't want, I've already got an if here, so I don't want to have too many ifs in my sentence. Okay, so this is saying x, the class x contains zero and it's closed under the successor. If the class X is closed under um, zero, contains zero and is closed under successor, then well, uh, the natural number should be the smallest such class. Yes, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I was just wondering if uh, you wanted to write that there, but now I see. Sorry. Yes, I do. Yes. But uh, so if this and this, then this. But, I agree the indentation is not perfect. Python would probably not like it. Um, um, I, well, okay. But uh, I'm just saying the indentation is also not perfect. And so, you know, the programming language Python is very fussy about indentation. Um, so then, what do I want to say? N is a subclass of X. Okay, so these three properties. These three properties. Right? And that is all the action for the natural numbers. Okay, so hopefully, nothing very surprising here. Um, the only thing that's a bit more general than what's usually done is that uh, I'm allowing the class of natural numbers, the collection of natural numbers, to be a class. So let me just.
someone to make is that this notion of natural number structure essentially allows us to do all, all the mathematics we want to do or, or has ever been done about the natural numbers. So the whole number theory follows from this definition. You've got a natural number structure, you can, any statement about the number theory of natural numbers, something about primes or what have you, you can formulate it as a property of, of this structure and it will be provable. The, the mathematical proof that we have, um, there are some slight issues here in what I'm saying, but essentially the mathematical proof we have can be carried out from our axioms the set theory modulo some issues that we'll look at um, a little bit later. It's a very simple definition and it's actually very powerful. And the first illustration of how powerful it is is the following result, which is a very important one. So here we're characterizing the natural numbers as we have a zero, we have a successor operation. And it is the smallest collection of things that contains the zero and is closed under successor. To do mathematics with the natural numbers, one often wants to, in particular, to be able to define functions involving the natural numbers. In particular, say functions from the natural numbers to other structures, for example, sequences. So that's uh, a sequence, an infinite sequence is a function from the natural numbers to the, whatever set of values we're having in the infinite sequence. It's not immediately clear from this definition how we're going to be able to use this definition to be able to define interesting sequences. In fact, we can, and the ability to do this follows from the axioms of set theory, and it requires a little bit of a technical proof to show it. But what I want to do is state the theorem that says that we can do this. And it has a technical proof. I also want to give the technical proof in the lecture, but I think I'm going to postpone this to the last hour of the lecture, the technical proof. So we'll have the, the sort of story part of the lecture in the first two parts, and then a technical proof in the last part. So the theorem is what's called the recursion theorem. And that follows from this. Um, so oh, there's something on the chat here. Oh no, it's okay. Uh, yes, I want my notes. The recursion theorem the recursion theorem is going to tell us how we can use a natural number structure in one particularly important way in mathematics. So let's suppose we have a natural number structure. I might have reversed the order of things, but never mind. Doesn't matter what order we write the component. Zero is zero and S is successor, is a, is a natural number structure. So the point is, if we've got such a thing, we can use it to index a sequence as long as we're given some data that will define a sequence, an infinite sequence by a recursive rule. So a recursive rule for an infinite sequence is the first element of the sequence, together with a rule that tells us if we've got the current element of the sequence, we have a rule that will give us the next element of the sequence. So how are we going to wrap that up as, a, as some data in set theory to, to, to put in our recursion theorem? Um, so given any triple, so the idea is 
we've got a triple consisting of some class of things. So just some collection of values. Some function, which is going to be a function on this plot from A to itself, which is going to be our recursive, our recursive rule. And a little a, which is going to be the first element of the sequence. So this, so given this data where A is a class, F, F from, so capital A is a class, F from capital A to itself is a class function. That's just a function on the class A, an endo function from the class to itself. It's a class function. Well, I'll just say function, but it's a function between classes. Um, and A is a little, is an element of the class capital A. And the point is there is going to be a sequence indexed by the natural numbers that starts at little a and whose second, so that's the zero indexed element. And the first, the one indexed element is going to be f of little a, and the two indexed element is going to be f of f of little a, and the nth indexed element is going to be f iterated n times applied to little a. So what having these indices means is there exists a function from the natural numbers to a that defines that sequence. So we're going to say, given this data, there exists a class function, but actually this data doesn't just give us some sequence, it gives us a unique sequence. There's a unique sequence with that specifying information. So, so there's going to be, there exists a unique class function. So again, I won't say class, but it's a unique function. So I'm going to call it R. It's recursively defined in a sense. The recursion theorem is we are recursively defining a function from N to A such that, so S dot T dot such that, um, R of zero is little a, the starting element. So this is our sequence of R applied to zero, R applied to one, R applied to two. That's our sequence that we want to define. So R of zero is little a, and for all natural number indices of elements in the sequence, R applied to the successor of A. So the next element of the sequence is always got by applying F to the current element of the sequence. Putting an asterisk here because this property that we preserve the zero point, if you like, the zero point gets mapped to the start of the sequence, and we prefer we, we pre preserve an operation like a said the successor operation is mapped to the F operation. This is like being a homomorphism in algebra for an algebraic structure. So I'm going to call the function satisfying this star a homomorphism. Um, so, so we call any R satisfying star, just to have some useful terminology, satisfying star a homomorphism structures. In other words, given this data that's recursively defining a sequence, there's a recur there is a unique homomorphism from the natural number structure to this data, to, to the thing defining the sequence. Um, right. So it looks very innocent because it's absolutely clear this is true for the natural numbers. I mean, we're just 
very familiar with this in mathematics. If we have an element and we have a function acting on it, we can, of course, define a sequence. We use it every day. It's basic mathematics going back to high school um, or, or even earlier. So why make a song and a dance about it in set theory? Well, the point is, this is our characterization. This is what we mean. This is the thing we can say easily. We can make this definition what it means to be a natural number structure. And this is a theorem. This means a definition that gives us this way of defining sequences turns out to be a theorem of the axioms of set theory. And it's actually not totally easy to prove this from this, from the definition using the axioms of set theory. It's rather technical. And as I said, I'm going to put that in the last hour of the lecture. I'm going to postpone a rather technical proof of this. Um, I do need to move the camera now. Just out of interest, I know first year of um, Dodikovsky study was a long time ago, but maybe some of you can remember. Hands up if you think you've proved this in Dodikovsky. No, no, no. As okay. far as I remember, Professor Bauer only sketched how we construct the natural numbers from sets, but right. he didn't prove anything. Right, okay. So I'm not going to prove much. I will also talk about how we define the natural numbers from sets, um, but we are going to prove this. So this is going to be the one, the one thing we put some effort into today for, for the proving it. Um, in a sense, it's really nice that set theory is a foundation of mathematics that one can use these axioms for set theory to define mathematical structures and to prove properties of them. It's really nice that you don't want to see too much of it because the, the proofs are quite technical, the definitions and the proofs are quite technical. And essentially, what's doing is very technical stuff to get very basic mathematical results out at the end. So, um, so I, will, I will say, I will do this one that, uh, that will then be, I think, enough of a taste of this style of proof um, for, for today. But let's just assume we've proved this now. And let's think of some of the things that fall out as consequences. It's a very simple corollary. Of the recursion theorem is that if we have two natural number structures, then they're isomorphic. So, so any two natural number structures And let's call them n zero with it. So n with zero and successor, and n prime with zero prime and successor prime. So in defining the natural number structure, we did not say what the element zero is and what the function s is. We just defined it to be a collection of things that contains zero, it's first and successor, and satisfies these three properties. But it now falls out immediately from this theorem. If we've got two of these, then they are isomorphic. So we really are characterizing the natural numbers up to isomorphism. Why does this fall out immediately? Well, hopefully some of you can see it. I'm not going to ask you, but indeed, so in other words, we can see that from this theorem, well. If we have one natural number structure and another natural number structure, let's make this n prime, this s prime, and this zero prime, then the unique homomorphism we get from the one structure with n to the other structure with n prime, that's one direction of the isomorphism. And the other direction of the isomorphism, well, they're both natural number structures, so we can apply the same theorem to n prime, but a recursion theorem also for n prime, that gives us the um, that gives us the homomorphism in the other direction. So indeed, if 
Um, so if I from n to n prime and I prime from n prime to n are the unique isomorphisms. Then they turn out to both be isomorphisms. So if we compose I prime with I and the other way around, I compose with I prime, and these are the identity functions on whichever way around, as you said, I goes back. So this one's on N, this, this goes from N to itself, and this goes from N prime to itself. So these are the identity functions on N and N prime, respectively. Why are they the identity functions? Well, I and I prime are both homomorphisms. So the composite of two homomorphisms, but by the definition of homomorphism, is easily itself a homomorphism. So this composite is a homomorphism from the natural numbers to itself, but there's a unique such homomorphism by the uniqueness property in the recursion theorem. And since the identity function is clearly such a homom is clearly a homomorphism from the natural numbers to itself, this is the identity. So it's a really short proof, which I've just summarized in words. I'm not going to write it down. Um, and we see that any two natural numbers factors are isomorphic. Um, I just want to carry on a little bit more uh, before, before the first break. So that's one corollary. Another whole range of corollaries of this defining functions by recursion is that we can use these, this recursion theorem to define the usual operations that arithmetic operations, for example, that we have on the natural numbers. So obviously the natural numbers would not be very useful if we couldn't define addition and multiplication and exponentiation and all these kinds of standard arithmetic operations. So we're going to see that those are definable from this theorem. But in fact, they're going to be definable from a slight generalization of the theorem. We're going to have the parameterized, parameterized recursion theorem. The parameterized says recursion theorem is the same thing except that it allows us to define the sequence parametrically in some more information given by another parameter variable. So here we're defining a, a function in one variable. I suppose we have another, I suppose we want to define a, num, a function in two variables where the other variable we think of as a parameter. So we're going to give ourselves a class for the parameters. So given a class Z and a triple again with we want to define again elements of a set, sorry, of a class using a recursive rule and some starting data. The starting data is now going to be given by a function because it's going to be given par parametrically in, um, in the parameter Z. So we need to just change this. F is so A is again a class. F is now a function that works. It's a it's a, a function from A to A parametrically in the first argument set. So it's a function of two variables. The first one's a parameter, so we can think of it as a family of functions from A to A, parameterized by the argument Z. That's the underlining here. The sense of potential is potentially a class. And the starting data is now not just a single element of, the, of A, but we're going to get an a starting element for each parameter value Z. So our starting data is a B 
that is a function that gives a given a parameter value will give us the starting value in A. But then we ask for that to exist a unique function. Well, the theorem tells us there exists a unique function z times. Um, oh, sorry for I forgot to move the camera. Ah, uh, so z times so this goes from from the natural number. So we get a recursively defined function from the natural numbers to a. So it's a, it's a family of sequence parametrically in the z such that the whole parameter values in the parameter argument z. If we apply the R applied to the Z value and zero is the starting value given by the B function. And for all N, again, the recursive value, if we apply R, now we need to give a parameter there, Z. S of n, that's the same as if we get, if we apply f to the same parameter value to the, so I'm doing the blue and black so you see what's new essentially, so z applied to um, the recursive function applied to again, we need z in here, and then we go to uh, uh, n. And I'll take off the bits of homomorphism because that no longer applies. It's a family of homomorphisms now, parametrically in Z. So, why did I want to do that? Well, um, oops. Okay. I want to be able to include things like the following examples. So here's an example. So we're going to take an instance of this theorem. And hopefully, if all the parameters are a bit confusing, hopefully the example will help give you will help illuminate the reason for the parameters. We're going to take our parameter space to be z. Sorry, our parameter space z, we're going to take to be a natural number structure. And Our space of values we're also going to take to be a natural number structure. So we're going to end up defining a function R, which is a two argument function on the natural numbers, from the natural numbers to itself. And to do this, this the data we need is we need a, a family of starting values given by parametrically in the argument Z. So our function B is going to be B of Z simply said it's simply the identity function so b is now it's a function from our parameter space z which is the natural numbers to it's to our value space which is also the natural numbers so we can have the identity function there and our function f which is from the parameter space to the values the parameter space together with the value space to the two variable function into the value space. So this is going to take a z and um, natural number n. And this is just going to be a successor function of the natural number structure applied to n. So we're going to take these 
So this so this defines add defines add add. Consider so we we want to consider this data. Given this data, we have apply the parameterized recursion theorem to it, and it gives us a unique function R in the from the parameter space times the natural numbers to the value space, all of which from the natural numbers and the natural numbers to the natural numbers to itself, satisfying these two properties. And when we write them out for the parameterized recursion theorem. gives us a unique function R from the natural numbers times the natural numbers to itself such that well firstly if we apply R to Z and zero we get B of Z so R applied to Z, so that's a natural number and zero will give us D of Z, which is Z, so that's just Z. And secondly, if we apply R to Z and the successor of a number N, then what we get is F applied to Z and R of Z of N. Well, F forgets the first argument and gives us the successor of the second argument. So we just get the successor of R of Z of N. So this is the successor of R of Z of that. So we've got a two argument function on the natural numbers that if given Z and zero, it gives us back Z. And if given Z and the successor of a number, it gives us back the successor of what we get from Z at N. So somebody must be able to see, hopefully, what, what is this function R normally known as? Uh, perhaps addition? Addition, indeed. If we add Z to zero, we get Z. If we add Z to the successor of a number, that's the same thing as taking the successor of what we get if we add to the number itself. So those properties characterize addition. So so we have defined addition and we will usually use the normal notation. So we have defined addition in set theory. Modulo proving this theorem. And of course, henceforth we will Know that if we have a natural number structure, we can define addition on it. And rather than using R, which is generic for any function defined by recursion, I will of course refer to addition as plus and write it in the usual way. Once you have addition, it's not hard to change the recipe a little bit and define multiplication. Once you define multiplication, again, you can change the recipe a little bit and define exponentiation. So we actually have now quite a sort of powerful tool for building more complicated functions. I shall leave it at addition. It's eight minutes past. Um, is it okay with you? I'm sorry about the slight delays at the beginning setting up the technology. Uh, which hopefully it's working. Is it okay with you to have a break until 20 past? Um, so that's 12 minutes break. Okay, good. So we'll break until 20 past. Uh, so break until 20 past. That's the Zoom. Okay, so in the first part, we saw the abstract definition of a natural number structure. So it is a collection, a class of entities that behaves like the natural numbers in that it um, has a zero successor. It has an induction principle um, that's in the definition. From that, we have this recursion theorem 
it allow, allows us to define um, sequences or functions out of the natural numbers. And uh, a version of the recursion theorem, the parameterized one allowed us to define the to define addition. As I said, we can extend that with um, with to define multiplication, exponentiation. One can then start to do one's got uh, operations on numbers, and one can start to do number theory and prove properties by induction. But in fact, set theory gives a lot more powerful principles to prove properties as well. Um, in any case, we can go ahead and start to do some number theory from from there. I did I did not tell you how to define the order on the natural numbers. You can think about that for yourselves. Once you've got addition, it's actually relatively easy to do, to define the order from that. The, the order does not to be need to be part of the of the definition. So what I want to begin this part by is the results that says that. Actually, the axioms of set theory already give us essentially the, the natural numbers. So here we've just said what it means for a class to be a natural number structure. But surprisingly, from the axioms we've got, we can show that a natural number structure exists. So the theorem, which I'm not going to prove in detail because it would take a it takes really a lot of work to prove it in detail, but I will give you the idea for the proof, which will be something you've already seen in the, in the first year as well. So the theorem is, um, if the universe is non-empty, so assuming the universe is non-empty, otherwise we can't really do anything. So I know you had a discussion in the exercise class about the universe being non-empty. So if we were doing a formal theory of sets in first order logic, which in the background we really are, and I will talk about this formal theory of sets in first order logic in the very last lecture of the course, um, then the non-emptiness of the universe is automatic because that's a theorem of first order logic anyway, that the universe is non-empty. Um, but just given the axioms as I formulated them, there's nothing, no, nobody's telling us we need to be using first, to be thinking of it as a formalized theory in first order logic. And given them as I formulated last week, it would make sense to consider the possibility of having an empty universe. Of course, it would not be very interesting. So it does make sense in the context of the lectures to make this assumption. If the universe, the point is that, is that all we need is the assumption that the university is not empty, nothing stronger than that then a natural number structure exists. Quite surprising. So I put an explanation mark after it. Once again, similar to last week, we're going to follow the same general pattern, and this is going to be useful in more sophisticated cases later in the course. So the general pattern is we have an abstract definition of what a structure, what properties we need a structure to, uh, to possess in order to play the role we want for it. So in our case, the role of being of acting like the natural numbers. Um, any two such structures are isomorphic. But to show that one exists, we need to construct a particular one um, by using specific definitions of the specific set theoretic definitions of the structure. Once we've done that, we never need to again, we never need to refer to those specific definitions again. But the role of them is merely to show that our axioms are enough to prove that such a structure exists. And so the idea here is we define a concrete, a particular choice of natural number structure. I'll just write NNS, not the natural number structure, by choosing particular sets as representatives natural numbers. And 
wants to... We've chosen the, so we choose a particular representative for zero, a particular representative for one, a particular representative for two. So, it, so essentially we're choosing a particular representative for zero and a particular representation of the successor function. And once we've done that, we, we merely then say the collection of the sets we get in that way, that's our natural number structure. Um, so then the class of such representatives is class of such representatives is our natural number structure. But it requires quite a substantial proof, which as I've already told you, I'm not going to do to make it work. So, so how are we going to represent numbers? We represent natural numbers using what's it called? Von Neumann numbers or numerals sometimes. Von Neumann numbers after the very famous mathematician uh, John from the end von, von Neumann, who uh, was very important in many areas of mathematics and also you know, physics. But he came up with this representation of the natural numbers in set theory. This is probably something that we saw in the first year in Logica in Nojitsa. So we choose a representative for zero and then representatives for all the other natural numbers. And um, the representative of zero, well, I forgot to change the camera. I did, thank you very much, yes. Uh, it's going to take some getting used to. Um, sorry about that, both to the person who is on Zoom and also to the video. Uh, oh, come on, and that's going the wrong way. Maybe I should leave somebody else in charge of this, um, but that, that wouldn't be, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Um, sure, a bit of AI software I could do it. Um, it would be very useful. Anyway, so zero is going to be represented as, well, now I'm going to go back over to this board, but I'm, I'm not going to move the camera. The universe is not empty. So we have some X in the universe. They've got some x in the universe we can make a singleton out of it. So we've got the singleton set x. And once we've got the singleton set x, we can use the separation axiom. So we use the pairing axiom to make the singleton set. Once we've got the singleton set, we can use the separation axiom to have the set, the subset of all the elements of the set singleton x that satisfy false. So that's the empty subset. So we have an empty set. So that's just to say, if the universe is not empty, then we have the empty set in our universe. So we always, as long as the universe is not empty, we have the empty set. That's an if and end if, of course. So we can say, it's natural to say that zero is the empty set. And then von Neumann's construction was to then say, well, one is going to be the set that's not empty, but its only element is the empty set. Two is the set that contains, again, it contains the empty set, but it also contains one. And in general, every number is going to be the set of all numbers strictly smaller than it. So three is going to be, so everything's smaller. So, so we're going to have zero, we're going to have one. And we're going to have two, so that's the set to zero. Well, and I've already got fed up with writing them. But you see the pattern, and the pattern in general is that the successor operation is x max two. The set we get by taking the union of x 
with the singleton set that contains X. I'm going to use a notation for that. X superscript plus. And this operation can be defined. So this makes sense. So X plus makes sense. Whenever X is a set of sets. So a set, all of whose elements are themselves sets. So this, so this kind of equal should be the other way around. Uh, I'm defining X plus to be this operation X union single to X. But just to say, I mean, I'm not going to every lecture throughout this course go talk about how every construction is derived from the axioms, but because we're still early on in the course, let me talk about, let me just tell you how the binary union is derived from the axioms. Well, the binary union makes sense if you've got um, between, so it makes sense between two, hang on, yeah. All right, this makes sense whenever X is a set. Doesn't need to be a set of sets. The binary union is an operation that takes two sets as arguments. And of course, you know what it does. It collects the elements of both the sets. But we get that from last week's operation by we first construct, use the pairing axiom to construct the set whose two whose elements are X and singleton of X. So the pairing axiom to form a set of two elements. And then we apply the union, the big union axiom that takes the union of a family of sets given as a set of sets to that. So we apply the pairing and the union axiom to get this binary union operation. The x plus makes sense when x is a class. Um, no, because the point of a set, so the, the point of the universe is it's the collection of things that we are allowed to use as elements for sets. So to form this element, this um, construction here, X needs to be something we can use as an element of a set because we're using it as the element of a singleton set. And so in order to use X as an element of a set, it has to belong to the universe. So a collection that belongs to the universe is a set by definition. So it's the same. The same answer to your similar question last week, for the same reason. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, it's a good question, and the, the, the distinction between sets and classes is important. So classes are large collections of things. Sets are, in a sense, well-behaved collections that satisfy our axioms. But the important thing about sets is we use we can use sets as elements themselves of collections. Okay. Uh, right. So, so this is the informal definition of the von Neumann numbers. But we want to show that we have a natural number structure following from the axioms. So I don't want to do any of the proofs, but I do want to give you the mathematical definition of the class of such von Neumann numbers. So you can see what the class is. It's start, it's the class that contains the empty set, the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, all defined in this way by this rule. But how can we define that in a simple way in set theory, in a way that does not involve using the natural numbers themselves in order to define it? Because the whole point is we want to show that some na that natural numbers exist. We don't have the natural numbers around at the moment. We want to construct them without having the natural numbers to hand. So how can we do that? So let's move the camera. Um. So we're going to define a property, a property of an element of the universe that holds only for von Neumann numbers, that characterizes 
the von Neumann numbers. So I need to refer to my notes here because it's a bit subtle. So we notice all the von Neumann numbers, they're all sets of sets. They are sets and the elements of them are themselves sets. The definition is, again, to, again, to define what it means for a set of sets, so a set of sets X is a von Neumann number. I'll just write D and number. I've got it written in full on the other board. If two properties hold, and they're both rather subtle. So the first one is for every subset of X, Any subset of, of, of X satisfying two properties, so there's going to be a sort of induction property. We're going to formulate a kind of induction property that if you have a von Neumann number and it contains zero, and it's con and you've got a subset of it that contains zero, and it's closed under successor as long as you stay in the number itself, then that's the whole of the number. It's like a bounded induction property. So to formulate that, we say that if you have any subset Y that satisfies the property that the empty set is contained in Y as long as it's contained in X. So of course, the empty set need not be contained in X, in X because the, the um, X might be empty. As long as the empty set belongs to X, it belongs to Y. And as long as we have any element belonging to y, the successor belongs to x, the successor also belongs to y. So, and so for all, as long as we have any element of y, the successor belongs to z, so it belongs to x, then the successor belongs to y. So y is closed under zero and successor as long as we stay inside the set X that we want to be a von Neumann number. So for every subset satisfying this kind of bounded induction property, it holds that that subset is the whole of X. Okay, as it should be, because if we put zero in, as long as zero belongs to X, and we've put the successor of everything in whenever that successor belongs to X. Secondly, what way I just said for every subset y under yeah yeah sorry um very good yeah that would not be much of a conclusion yeah so y has to then equal the whole of x um secondly either x is zero or it's a successor so all that exists is that in x and it's not just a successor it's the successor of one of its elements so remember the von Neumann numbers well, they're all, each number is the set of all numbers strictly less than it. So if it's not zero, then there's a largest number strictly less than it, and it should be the successor of that number. So it's kind of clear that both these properties hold of the von Neumann numbers. But the point is that's interesting is that they characterize exactly the von Neumann numbers. And that requires quite a lot of proof. And as I've already told you, I'm not going to do that. Um, Okay, and then so that's the property that characterizes characterizes if an element of our universe is a von Neumann number. So it has to be a set of sets, and it has to satisfy one and two. And then we define. I'm sorry. Um, or maybe I'll put it on the other board.
question? Yes, please. Can you just elaborate on the second one? What does that mean? There, there exists a Z that that's a Z plus O. Okay, very good. Um, well, so the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to move the camera again, but um, there's a question which is to elaborate on the second point on, that was on the board that I, I was just showing, which says that um, the X that is a von Neumann number must be empty or it must be the successor of some element of it. Um, well, hopefully it's clearly true that a natural number is either empty or it's a sorry, it's either zero or it's a successor. So it's basically saying that num a number is either a zero or a successor. If we don't, and to be a successor, well, we've got a collection of sets, and we want those sets to be the numbers strictly smaller than the one we're looking at. So if it's a successor, and if it really is a von Neumann number, there should be an element of the set, which is the largest number that's that's strictly smaller than it. There should be an element of the set itself, that's the Z, such that X is the successor of that Z. So that's why it's true of a von Neumann number. If we did not put this property in, then the definition we've got would also include the set of all natural numbers itself, that also satisfies property one here. And that is not a natural number. The set of all natural numbers, it would be like an infinite number. In fact, it's going to be the ordinal omega later on in the course, that, that, that set. So if we did not put the second property, we would have other things that satisfy one, other sets that satisfy one that are not natural numbers. Okay, good question. Um, so what I wanted to say is that we're going to just define a class of von Neumann numbers, which is defined to be a class of all x's, but that x is a set of sets. And x is a von Neumann number, as defined on the, on the board. Theorem is that, that the structure we get by considering that class of von Neumann numbers, the operation, so the plus operation, but so the, the successor and the empty set, this is a natural number structure. The truth is very technical, and I'm going to leave it at, at this. I've given you the construction, but I'm not going to give you the technical truth. It involves basically manipulating with these von Neumann sets. It's, it's, a, it's fiddly. It's quite actually interesting. It's a bit like playing with, with Lego in some ways. You're sort of making these constructions using building blocks, and you have to... Well, I don't know. Anyway, you have to see that the definitions all work out. I find that kind of thing actually quite fun, but I'm not going to spend much of time on it. Um, if you want to, you're encouraged to do it for yourselves and try to prove it. Um, I think you'll also do some exercises in the exercise class on Thursday related to this. So we've got quite a long way so far, only with the axiom that the universe is not empty. Well, the axioms from last week and the axioms that the universe is not empty. It's one other thing we really want. There's more than the, than the existence of a natural number structure concerned, concerning the natural numbers. Can anyone think what's missing? Well, so we can define, so we want it to be ordered. We want the order relation to have good properties. We can define that and prove it from the fact that it's a natural number structure. Okay, there's, there's something. There's going to be an axiom called the axiom of infinity, which we haven't used so far. We've done all this, we've got the natural numbers, we've got a natural number structure as I've defined it without the axiom of infinity. 
What else can an axiom of infinity say? Can anyone think what, what we're missing? That there exists an infinite set. Right, so the axiom of infinity is going to say there exists an infinite set. What do you think will happen to our natural number structure if we have that axiom that we don't have at the moment? It will be set. That it will be a set. Very good. So, yeah, so that indeed, the point is that our natural numbers at the moment, we've found them, that we can define them as these von Neumann, as these, the collection of von Neumann sets, but we don't know that the collection of all the von Neumann sets itself forms a set. We can define the collection, it's a class. And we cannot prove that from the axiom so far. So this brings us to the axiom of infinity because there are many things we can do for sets that we can't do for classes. Uh, consider power sets of them, which is going to be very useful. Well, there is a kind of power class, but the power set of a set is a very important construction. So we're going to need the axiom of infinity. And by The axiom of infinity the axiom of infinity is indeed going to say exactly what you said that there exists an infinite set. So we need to define an infinite set that can be done in various different ways. The definition I like is the following. So, um, so we say that a set X is infinite if there exists some injective function, or so it's a can, but there is some injective function from X to itself that is not at the same time surjective. So if you have a finite set and you have an injective function from the set to itself, it is automatically also surjective. Think about that, but I mean, you must have thought about that many times in your mathematical education so far. Um, at an infinite set, you can have an injective function from X to itself that is not surjective. And that is a good definition of when a set is infinite. So from X to X, that is not surjective. Or another word for this is a, there is a proper injection from X to itself. That's a, another English phrase for such a an injective function that's not surjective, a proper injection. Anyway, let me write it out explicitly. So it's not surjective. And I'm going to formulate this as a proposition. Following our equivalent, T, F, A, B. So the first one is, there exists an infinite set. The second one is there exists a set, a set of sets I such that. It contains the empty set and it's closed under the von Neumann successor operation. And for all x belonging to i, x plus also belongs in, into i. So there exists a set containing the empty set closed under the von Neumann successor operation. Of course, this need not be the set of von Neumann numbers itself. It's going to contain them all, but it could be larger. 
It's just saying there's, there's some set that has those properties. If there exists some such set, there will be a smallest such one. And actually that smallest such set will be exactly the class Vn of von Neumann sets that we've got, the von Neumann numbers that we've got here. And it's actually equivalent to say that that is a set. So it's equivalent to say the class Vn is a set. And the fourth equivalent statement, uh, I'm just wondering where to write it. I won't write it. Let me just tell you, a fourth equivalent statement is that you uh, would like me to write it. Uh, I shall put it in blue then. And just to, as long as it's very simple. I mean. It's, yeah, well, it's maybe, Oh, this is the blue that writes like a black again. <laughs> haven't, haven't encountered that one today. That was uh, in last week's lecture. Um, right. Moreover, so this is continuing from here. If N zero S is any natural number structure, then also, also the next statement, and also, well, the next statement is belongs to the following R equivalent, so it's counted as one of the equivalent statements. And the next statement is, of course, that let's put an underlying as it's prima facie a class, and that N is a set. So any natural number structure, its underlying class will be a set. Okay, these are all equivalent statements, and the axiom of, of the axiom of infinity is any of. I mean, you can formulate it in any of the ways we've got here. Doesn't doesn't matter. So, could be there exists an infinite set. That's a nice formulation, but that just says there is some infinite set. It's a bit wishy washy in a sense. So all our other axioms were specific classes form sets. And if you want it in that form, then axiom three is the nice form. It's not really a nice form because the definition of the class VM is quite complicated. But on the other hand, it is of this form, a specific class is a set. So let's put that in red because it's important. The axiom of infinity is any of statements One four. Okay, so it's five to four, but we actually, since we started five minutes late, I'm going to go for another ten minutes now, and then we'll have then we'll have a break, then we'll have a short break. And then the last part is going to be technical, and it will also be a shorter part than, than usual. I just want to go through the technical proof. Um, but let me just, I want to do, in 10 minutes, we've done the natural numbers. In 10 minutes, I want to do the real numbers. So that's a bit of imbalance in a sense. We're not spending so long on it. But uh, having done the natural numbers, we've put a lot of work into one thing. And uh, real numbers, perhaps don't require so much time because in a sense, a lot of the work is you're familiar with from analysis. The thing is that in analysis, so where is, whereas with the natural numbers, starting with this abstract definition of a natural number structure seems quite heavy handed for something as simple as the natural numbers takes a bit of getting used to if we have to work hard to do this regression theorem and get an even defined emission and so on. So you have to do something like this in order to define the natural numbers in set theory, but it seems a bit heavy handed. Whereas for the real numbers, such an axiomatic treatment does not seem quite so heavy handed because one is already used to it from analysis. When you learn analysis, you are, I mean, what, 
yeah, one approach, and I think that it's also followed, it's also the approach that's followed here is one starts off with the axiomatic definition of the real numbers as a complete ordered field. So the real numbers, how do we get the real numbers in set theory? So just to make life, well, essentially we need it now. We're now going to assume the axiom of infinity. So for the rest of the course, um, so henceforth, henceforth, this is, sorry, this is on the other board. But henceforth, assume the axiom of infinity. Now we could define the real numbers as a class, but we've got the axiom of infinity. If we define them as a class, we're going to be able to prove their reset. Let's just stop making life difficult for ourselves, and let's just, to begin with, call them a set, just to, just to start living in the world of mathematics as it's done. Um, so, a real number structure. Is it's going to be a set R together with field operations on it. So in particular, we've got the addition, the additive structure zero and plus um, and minus group and uh, and the multiplicative structure one and times and or we can define one over x using uh, we're going to be able to define that anyway so let's not bother with that we don't we can also define the minus as well um, but anyway we'll, and we want the order the strict order um, such that r is a set is a set and this structure gives the set R, it endows it with the structure of a complete ordered field, as defined in analysis. So, so, so R is a set endowed with the structure as specified there. And I'm not going to write out what it means to be a complete ordered field because it's a lot of axioms and I would just be writing the axioms as they're normally formulated. I mean there would be nothing nothing special about writing them in the language of set theory because they are in any case normally written in the language of set theory. So endowed with a structure of a complete ordered field. Just a remark, the axioms of a complete ordered field make essential use of set theory because the completeness axiom in particular says that any bounded subset of real numbers has a supremum. Any bounded inhabited, so non empty subset of real numbers has a supremum. So one's crucially using the fact of a set of numbers and the notion of an arbitrary subset of real numbers. In order to formulate that axiom. So we make heavy use of, well, essential use of set theory in the notion of the structure of a complete ordered field. Um, and in set theory, we can prove, we can prove from our axioms, and this is the usual proof that one does in analysis. Right? Any two real number structures are isomorphic. And here an isomorphism will be a field homomorphism in each direct order preserving field homomorphisms in each direction. But in a sense, there's nothing exciting here. The only thing we need to do is once again prove 
that assuming that we that the real numbers exist is not adding anything new to our axioms. The point is our axioms as they are now that we've added the axioms of infinity are sufficient as a foundation for mathematics. They don't have the axiom of choice, but they're sufficient as a foundation for mathematics. Um, and once again, there's going to be the theorem that a real number structure exists. So just we're always abstractly characterizing our structures and then stating a theorem that the structure can be proved, such a structure can be proved to exist on our axiom. So again, theorem, a real number structure. And I'm just going to, in three minutes, outline how one constructs a real number structure. So it's very, very quick, but I guess I'll check this with you afterwards, but I guess you've seen it before, and I don't want to go into the details of, of how things work in this case, but to define the real number structure, well, we've got the natural numbers, so we, we want to sort of Use the natural numbers to define the real numbers. So, so to define the real, to define the reals. So if we use, so we use the natural numbers. Let me just call them old face n, like in ordinary mathematics. We use that to define define integers. So. Integers are pairs. One way of representing an integer is by pairs m n of natural numbers. Quotiented by the equivalence relation, but the idea is you represent an, int an, an integer as the difference of two natural between two natural numbers. So we're going to quotient it by the equivalence relation. And then equivalent to m prime n prime. If the difference between m and n as an integer is the same as the difference between m prime and n prime as an integer, so that's if and only if we can formulate that using natural numbers using only addition. That's if and only if n plus n prime equals m prime plus n. Okay. So an integer, we can form a set of integers as a set of equivalence classes of pairs of natural numbers. And then it's easy to define all the usual operations on integers. Um, let me use Z to define a set of rational numbers Q. So rational numbers can now be um, well, let's call them A and B. Again, pairs. So pairs A, B of integers, where B is not equal to zero. And the idea is that A comma B represents the rational number A divided by B. So again, we want to consider equivalence classes. So, so, so again, we're going to quotient by the relation that A divided by B, two things are 
equivalent if the quotient of a and b is the same as the quotient of a prime and b prime again we can formulate that using only multiplication on the integers which one can define easily on the integer notations i'm not going to do that but so we quotient quotiented by the equivalence relation a b is equivalent to a prime b prime if and only if a times b prime equals a prime times b and finally and one can for the integers one can define the total order on the integers with the rationals one can define the total order on the rationals the idea is now a real number can be represented as the set of rational numbers strictly smaller than the real number. Such a thing, such a set is called a Dedekind cut. Um, and the properties of such sets can be defined abstractly. Right. A real so R so a real number. Is defined as a Dedekind cut. The idea is to represent real numbers as the set of all rational numbers strictly smaller than the real number, and we can define the sets that are of rationals that arise in that way in purely intrinsic terms without referring to the real number that they define. So Dedekind cut is a subset. Um, C for cut is a subset of the rationals satisfying firstly it's inhabited, secondly it's bounded, so there exists an upper bound in Q such that the whole all elements of the cut are strictly less than the upper bound. Um, and thirdly, it is down closed. So if you have an element in the set, then any smaller element is in the set. So, so for all the Q belonging to the cut, then for all Q prime belonging to rationals. If Q prime is strictly less than Q, then Q prime is itself itself belonging to the cut. And those are the only properties you need, I believe. If I've missed one, you can point that out to me in the break, which we're now going to have. But the point is, these definitions allow us to define all the operations, the order on it, and then once we've got this, we can show that this. This construction of the reals, we can define, it's quite complicated. Addition and multiplication, it's quite complicated to prove that they work. That is, we can define the order relation on the reals, that's easy, that's just the subset relation on, 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 on Dedekind cuts. And with a lot of work, one can prove that this really is a, a, a complete ordered field. So we have a real number structure and we're done. Um, Okay, so oh, it's 10 past by, well, 11 minutes past by my watch. So what I propose is we have a 10 minute break now. The last part is purely going to be technical. It's going to be the proof of this recursion theorem. Anyone that feels they've had enough for today, I'm perfectly, oh, sorry, let me pause the video before I don't want to. Yes, you're right. I thought I'd forgotten something, but then I couldn't think. So I didn't have notes for this. So, so somebody has pointed out that I forgot the condition for the 
needed to be touched. So indeed, it really is important that for all Q and C, there exists a Q prime um, greater than Q such that Q prime belongs to C as well. So it's really, it's really important that the leader in cut doesn't have a largest element because you want it to be the set of rationals strictly smaller than a number. And if it has the largest element, that they would not enjoy that property. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Okay, so in this last part, I want to give um, the main ideas and is essentially the, the proof as a actually the, mainly the pretty much the whole proof of this recursion theorem as, as I've already told you the proof is rather involved essentially the idea is we've, we've characterized I, I've written up the recursion theorem again I haven't rewritten the definition of natural number structure but we've characterized the natural number structure as a structure with a zero a successor and this induction property and we want to use that characterization to show that if we've got this data, this class A with a, with a starting element for our sequence and a function acting on it that's the recursive rule for our sequence, if we've got that data, we can, that the, from the natural number structure, we can define using the axioms of set theory, a unique class function that actually defines the sequence indexed by our natural number structure. Right, so I'm going to, I'm not going to write this part out again, but I'm going to assume that we've got all this data. So we've got the natural number structure. We've got a particular class A, a particular element of the class little a, and a particular function that's our recursive rule for the sequence we want to define. And I'm going to then prove the theorem. So we want to prove that there exists a unique homomorphism R from our natural number structure to our structure with the class A and the element little a and the function little f. And to do this, we're going to build up the required homomorphism, which is defined on the whole of the natural numbers, by considering approximations to the, to the final function. So the approximation is just going to be defined on an initial segment of the natural numbers. And all those approximations, well, if we take the limit of them, all of them together define the, in the, the whole class function. So we're going to look at the notion of a partial homomorphism. I'm going to build the required homomorphism capital R out of partial homomorphisms. A partial homomorphism is it's going to be a function. I'm giving a definition here of a concept that's going to be important in the proof. It's a function into A from a subset, so actually a set, not a class, of the natural numbers, which is going to be an initial segment of the natural numbers. So where, um, so where X is a subset, so we're not, so for this proof, we don't need the axiom of infinity. So we, we forget, we don't, we don't need to know that the natural numbers are, are, are a set. Um, but we're actually going to look at subsets for our domain of the partial function as a subset of of um, then satisfying the point is it's going to be an initial segment. I want it to be non empty and I'm also going to require that it's closed under successor, so zero belongs to it. It's again, it's closed under successors that belong to the um. The subset x. So, so if if the successor of x belongs to x, sorry, not the closed end successor, it's closed end the predecessor. So if, if any successor, it's an initial segment. So you've got any natural number that belongs to whose successor belongs to x, then the natural number itself belongs to x. And the zero belongs to x, that's just saying it's non empty, really, because 
Otherwise, this would, in my consider, it belongs to X anyway. We've got to the other end. And we want it to be a partial homomorphism. That means we want it to behave like a homomorphism on its domain. We defined the, we defined the notion of a homomorphism for functions from whose domain was the whole of the natural numbers. Um, but here, the domain is a subset of the natural numbers. And we still want the homomorphism properties to hold. So, and function H satisfies Uh, so H of zero, so zero is all, always in the domain X, so H of zero will always de be defined. But of course, that want to be, we want that to be little a, and we want H applied to a successive function to satisfy the recursive rule we expect, as long as the successor is in the domain of the function. So we want H of the successor of some value x to be f of h applied to x whenever s of x is the successor of x really is in the domain of h. So whenever uh, s of x belongs to h, uh, sorry, belongs to the set capital X. Right, that's the notion of a partial homomorphism. The reason for using partial homomorphisms is we can, we're essentially going to prove by induction that for every number, there is a partial homomorphism, that there's a unique partial homomorphism to our structure A, whose domain contains that natural number. And then we can, use, we can apply that unique partial homomorphism, so actually not a unique one, but that there is, there is a partial homomorphism whose domain contains that natural number, and any two partial homomorphisms agree in the value they assign to that natural number. It's not a unique partial homomorphism because there'll be lots of partial homomorphisms with different domains. Um, but the value that they, are, they give to any number will always be the same. So we're going to prove two properties. So the first one is if you've got two partial homomorphisms, We've got some value x, some number that is in the intersection of the domains, so it is in the domain of both the homomorphisms. Then the two homomorphisms both agree in modeling the value they assign to x. The second property is. For every every natural number, there exists some partial homomorphism that has the natural number in its domain. Formulated these two properties. In each case, we can see it as a property of the element of an element x belonging to a little x belonging to the natural numbers. So in this case, the, in the case of statement one, the property is saying is the property that says for any two partial homomorphisms, both of whose domains contain little x. We, they coincide on the value of x. So that's so we can view it as a property of natural numbers. 
In the same way, this one, while this is more explicitly a property of natural numbers, for any natural number, there exists some partial homomorphism H from H that has little x in the domain. And when we view them both as property of natural numbers, then we can think, can we prove them using the induction property that's in our natural numbers structure that's part of the definition of the natural number structure? And indeed, we can. So, in fact, both properties are then proved once one's formulating things this way, rather straightforwardly from the definitions um, by induction. So, both properties. Proved using the induction property of a natural number structure by induction on the value of x. Induction on the value. So I will only do one of them and I will prove property two, which is the one that's slightly more involved. Um, Proof of two. So we're just going to prove by induction that this property holds. There always exists some partial homomorphism whose domain contains x. In the case that x is zero, well, we can just make the partial homomorphism, we can just make its domain the singleton zero. And that's Perfectly good as the domain of a partial homomorphism, it satisfies its property here. So, so if x equals zero, just define x to be singleton set zero and h partial homomorphism from x into a, well, we simply just define h of zero, we only need to define its value of zero, and we just define h of zero to be a. If x is greater than zero, well, our induction hypothesis, so the induction hypothesis, I, I dot h for induction hypothesis, is that we have sorry we should I shouldn't do I shouldn't use the order relation because we haven't defined it. Um, so in the case in the case of instead of dealing with x, we're dealing with successor of x assuming that our induction hypothesis applies to x. So in the case of the successor of x, um, the induction hypothesis gives us uh, a partial homomorphism h from x to a such that, there, such that x belongs to the domain x of the partial function h. So we're now going to define a new partial from a new partial homomorphism whose domain contains the successor of x. So we're going to first define its domain. So we define the domain to be we want to put zero in the domain. Uh, what's the um, uh, what's the small x there? Um, where is that from? Right. So we're proving a property by induction on x on little x. This is the case little x equals zero, and this is the case that we're proving the property for the successor of little x. And so little x is the predecessor of the successor of little x. Well, 
it is in the flux. Yes, but yeah. Sorry, I mean, yeah, good question. Uh, so we've got the domain of this part of function H contained in little x. We're going to define a larger domain by taking the successor of everything in the domain of in the domain of H and adding then zero to it. So it's essentially in that way extending the domain. So we've got the S of Y, the whole Y belonging to X. And then not difficult to show that this X prime satisfies these properties. It can pay the zero by definition. And, and if the successor of something is in the set then the thing itself is in the set, you can prove that. Um, so now we'd want to define a partial function A, the partial homomorphism H prime from X prime to A. And that's by we need to define it on this set, and we simply define H prime of Y to be A if let's call it Z. So an element of X prime is one of the, has one of these two possibilities. So in the case that it's zero, we define the value of the partial homomorphism to be the value of the play. If a, uh, so if, if z equals zero, and if it's the successor of y, that's the other possibility, well then we know what h does to y, and we're applying to the successor of that, so we want to satisfy the homomorphism property, so we need to do return f, of what H does on Y. So if that's how we get a homomorphism. So if Z equals S of Y, the sum, the sum of Y belonging to X. So these are all the possibilities for elements of the set X prime. And that does the job. And so we go over to the other side of the board. Uh, no, wrong way. And we proved one and two, and finally our function f maps an x in the natural numbers to h of x. Or some homomorph partial homomorphism, some or any partial homomorphism um, H from X to A with little x belonging to the domain of the partial homomorphism. By property two, such a partial homomorphism exists. By property one, the value that this gives us is uniquely defined. And therefore, this gives us a well defined function from the class, from the natural numbers class to A. And it's easy from the partial homomorphism property to then see that it satisfies the recursive, the homomorphism property for the recursive rule. Okay, so. Maybe that was a little bit fast. It was kind of just really to give you a taster of how this proof, how this style of proof works. From next week on, we're going to be going to the subject of cardinalities, and we're going to be sort of more, we'll be dealing with the axes, but more dealing with set theory as we normally use it a little bit, and not being not so much fussing over the axioms anymore, having already dealt with that today. Okay. Um, Good, so thank you very much. I, I need to rush, I'm afraid, but okay. if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Yes, we, did we prove the first one or? No, we didn't. Oh, it didn't. No, so we proved both of them by induction and I was, this okay. one's actually slightly more involved. Okay. Yeah, but so I was giving you an illustration of how we proved by right, in, in the case of the second property. Exercise proved the first property, um, if you want to.